Good morning. I'm Michael Baum. I'm uh, one of the uh, lawyers who was part of the trial team uh, my, with my partner, uh, Brent Wisner, who was the actual lead trial counsel. And um, we, uh, as a team, uh, leading up to this trial, acquired a lot of documents. Uh, many of which we uh, declassified and published last year, and you know them probably as the Monsanto Papers. Um, as part of the trial, we uh, were able to release some additional documents, and we have more that are not declassified yet that relate in particular to Europe that we will be uh, seeking declassification on soon. Uh, all of these documents are on uh, my law firm's website, Bomb Headland. Uh, it's B-A-U-M-H-E-D-L-U-N-D. Um, and if you did a Google search of Bomb Headland and Monsanto Papers, you'll get to a, a site that has uh, all of these documents that have been declassified so far. The documents that are part of this PowerPoint, I'm going to try to get through as much of as I can today. Uh, the opening and closing arguments uh, from the trial. And... Um, uh, this PowerPoint. So, um, what I uh, first want to impress upon uh, the people here in Europe, and this is an opportunity, you know, to express what I my personal feeling is, is that um, I want to impress upon you to, to protect IARC. Uh, uh, there are. Very few independent organizations like uh, the International Association for Research on Cancer that rely on peer-reviewed published literature to arrive at conclusions and that uh, they use actual science, not spun corporate stuff. Now, co that's actually probably more like marketing. These documents um, that I'm going to walk through and then, and then you can have access to uh, show uh, how Monsanto's spin has affected the scientific debate uh, regarding glyphosate and Roundup's carcinogenicity over the last 20 years or so. Um, I brought with me uh, some uh, thumb drives for those of you who want them that have all these documents on it. So in case I don't get through everything, you can get a thumb drive and uh, go through it then. Um, so, uh, go to the next slide. Um, what uh, these documents show is that, uh, that Monsanto is, uh, has been engaging in a, a series of efforts to uh, suppress science regarding the relationship of glyphosate or Roundup and carcinogenicity. In, in 1991, after some pretty sketchy animal studies have been used to get Roundup on the market, uh, Monsanto pressured the U.S. EPA to place Roundup in Category E as not likely to be carcinogenic. Within a few years, some European studies, independent, non-corporate sponsored studies, found that there was uh, DNA damage uh, possibly being caused by uh, uh, Roundup. And so uh, because... Uh, Monsanto had conveyed to the U.S. and to the world that there was no carcinogenicity problem, there was no need to put it in the labeling, uh, they had a problem. So next slide. And uh, this is a 1998 internal uh, uh, memos and, and emails regarding a, uh, a meeting that Monsanto had regarding those studies. And they were concerned that the papers by uh, Leoi and uh, Bolognese may present a big problem because these studies are with glyphosate and are on a more and they use standard endpoints. They're, up till then, Monsanto had fended off some of the studies that had been coming up and saying they'd used you know different, incorrect or not reliable endpoints. So these studies did use reliable endpoints. Donna Farmer. And the email, a uh, little excerpt from the email below, uh, they held a meeting regarding the mutagenicity, the inclination of a, a chemical to cause uh, DNA damage, um, in December of uh, 1998. She was a chief toxicologist for uh, Monsanto, and uh, there, there, she is saying it is a real concern that these papers may create an even bigger problem for us. Therefore, we need to do some things quickly. 
As EU has an immediate need and is a critical area now, it is agreed that this is Mark Martins, would uh, contact Dr. Perry next week to discuss with him his participation in, in the support of glyphosate, glyphosate-based formulations and genotoxic issues. What they're saying here is they wanted to hire uh, Dr. James Perry to, to make these studies uh, not seem so controversial and not look like they were a problem for Monsanto. So they hired him, and uh, Dr. James Perry reviewed the studies, and this is the next slide. Uh, the, Dr. Farmer uh, summarized his conclusions, and he essentially corroborated what those uh, European independent scientists concluded. And um, this is the excerpts, and these are also all on the, the – these thumb drives are on the website. So what did they decide to do? Did they decide to, like, go ahead and say, well, maybe this, these studies are valid and we need to warn people about uh, the deep potential DNA damage? No. Uh, what they decided to do was bury it. And uh, this is the next slide. Uh, Dr. Haydens, uh, who is uh, Dr. Farmer's uh, supervisor, said that they wanted to find someone who is comfortable with genotox profile and, G and glyphosate roundup who can be influential with regulators and scientific outreach operations. That was why they hired Dr. Perry. They wanted someone who could go to EFSA or go to the EPA and explain away these studies. And... Um, it t turned out that they'd spent some money on him, and they were regretting it, and they were hoping they hadn't spent too much money on him. And, we are, and then they, Dr. Perry, in his conclusion, said, you need to do these studies to really nail down whether uh, glyphosate or Roundup are safe. And they say here, we simply aren't going to do the studies Perry suggests. That's manipulation of science. That is suppressing science. They also decided that they were going to get someone else to, to convey the message to the regulators like EFSA and like the EPA, and uh, that would be a stronger supporter for the industry uh, than Dr. Perry appeared to have, uh, be. Um, so um, who did they hire? So next slide. They, well, it didn't, they, uh, conveyed data and got an analysis done by Dr. Gary Williams and Dr. Robert Crows and a, a Dr. Ian, Ian uh, Monroe. And this study was uh, had a more favorable conclusion regarding glyphosate and Roundup's carcinogenicity based on those studies and was cited through for the last 20 years. And uh, it was used... Uh, to, to convey to regulatory agencies like EFSA and EPA that there's not a problem. They also did not convey, and they suppressed the study, three studies that, uh, and analyses that Dr. Perry did. So they promoted this study, and they suppressed Dr. Perry's. And as it turned out, this next slide, uh, when they were... Um, trying to deal with what they expected the IARC was going to conclude about glyphosate and Roundup in 2015, they decided they wanted to collect up some experts to have an expert panel that would give them a more favorable spin than IARC gave them. And so uh, they were going to collect up some epidemiologists and toxicologists and genotoxicologists and have them write up things that would be uh, beneficial for fending off the IARC conclusions that there was that uh, glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen. And the thing that's revealing about this particular email, which is written in February of 2015, he reflects back on what they did back in 2000 when they had the problem with the European studies that showed DNA damage. We would be keeping the costs down by using by us doing the writing, and they would just edit and sign their names to speak. Recall that is how we handled Williams, Crow, and Monroe in 2000. They ghost wrote the, the Williams Monroe study, 
Instead of publishing Dr. Perry's results, they had uh, a study that, that whitewashed the problem and they ghost wrote it. Um, that's how science got manipulated. That's how it, uh, it got the safety and labeling of, of Roundup was manipulated here in Europe and around the world by using ghostwriting techniques like this. Next slide. So um, in March of 2015, uh, IARC uh, did conclude that glyphosate is a, a probable human carcinogen. And this was not news to Monsanto. They had known and had been fending it off uh, for years. Uh, they had uh, a couple of programs. One was called Let Nothing Go. Another one was called Freedom to Operate. And, and uh, another one, they, they refer to it as whack-a-mole, the child's game where you at an uh, uh, arcade where you whack moles down with a hammer that keep popping up. They had been playing whack-a-mole with independent science for years. So next slide. So um, one of the things that, that, that they did was they focused on uh, studies that just looked at the parts, not the formulations of Roundup. So they, uh, the regulatory agencies required uh, analyses of uh, glyphosate alone or the formulation of the, uh, of the surfactant alone or other uh, allegedly inert uh, uh, chemicals in Roundup. And um, what they didn't do was do a study of all of them together to show the synergistic effect. And so here's Donna Farmer again, their chief toxicologist, in August of 1999. And she's saying, I will not support doing any studies on glyphosate formulations or other surfactic ingredients at this time with the limited information we have on the situation. Um, this is uh, particularly important for uh, Europe because over time, uh, the France and Germany were, were extremely concerned about uh, the surfactant uh, taloamines, the POEA, that was considered by itself to be uh, a dangerous chemical. Um, and so they wanted to have uh, that chemical not part of the products that were being used in Europe. What uh, Donna Farmer and the scientists at Monsanto knew was that they had not actually tested the formulation of the glyphosate plus the surfactant on long-term carcinogenicity studies. So next slide. Five minutes to go. Okay. Um, so here uh, is an internal memo from December of 1999 when they're remarking on European uh, concern regarding the uh, surfactant that was added to glyphosate to help it be uh, more penetrable. And it, it, the, it caused it to penetrate the surface of plants and also to surf, uh, penetrate the surface of skin as well. So... Um, it's made it so that the glyphosate itself could be more easily delivered and harmful to either plants or humans or the microbiome in the human gut. Um, next slide. Uh, Mark Martins, uh, who is uh, the Monsanto's Director of Toxicology for Europe and Africa, um, also chimed in and said if somebody came to me and said they wanted to test Roundup, I know what I would, how I would react with serious concern. We have to really think about do, for, doing formulations even if they are not on the market. Here there was a discussion again of uh, someone saying maybe we should test formulations. They, don't want for, they did not want formulations studied for long-term carcinogenicity because they did not want the results. Uh, they did not want to see the results. Next slide. Uh, and even uh, years later, in 2009, uh, Donna Farmer was saying, uh, you cannot say that Roundup does not cause cancer. We have not done carcinogenicity studies with Roundup. Um, next slide. Um, they, in 2010, uh, Monsanto's Richard Garnett uh, Garnett of the Global Crop Protection Regulatory Affairs Strategy Lead for Monsanto Europe and Bill Haydens uh, were discussing again 
uh, what, what to do about uh, studies of formulations. If you start at the bottom with the January 25th, 2010 uh, email, uh, that it says, anyway, there are non-hazardous formulations, so why sell a hazardous one? That's a, a pretty telling little email. Despite the debate about the dangers of the, of, uh, the POEA and taloamines, they knew they had a non-hazardous formulation they could use, but they wanted to protect their market. So look up at the next the, the email above. And there's still a strong sentiment in St. Louis that we need to continue to defend taloamines even though we prepare to switch over because of their impending demise. Reasons to do so, domino effect on etheramines, other taloamines. Defend other world areas to the best of our ability. Second, I was in Brazil all last week. They are very worried about this coming across the Atlantic to their part of the American hemisphere. So they're going to continue to use the dangerous POEA taloamine that was being banned in Europe in order to protect their market in other places. They were continuing to defend it here. So in 2010, they had a strategy meeting of what to do about Germany wanting to ban it, uh, uh, POEAs there. And what was their solution? Push back on data requests and um, defend the POEAs, notwithstanding that they knew that they had a safer alternative. Next slide. Uh, and one of their concerns with respect to the French ANSIs uh, was that when they were withdrawing the POEAs, they wanted it just be because they wanted it to be uh, the precautionary principle. They didn't want it to be seen that there was a health problem. So here uh, we are expecting the letter of intention from French regulator ANSIs very soon, and it might point to imminent health risks regarding the use of taloamine. They wanted to manipulate and prevent France from saying that there was a health concern. They wanted it to just be, oh, we were just being uh, precautionary. Um, hmm? Oh, all right. I'm just going to flip, uh, flip through some of the rest of this. Yeah. Next slide. So they had a program of, of whack-a-mole that they organized attacking or preventing non-industry publications. And you may have all heard about a doctor, uh, Sarah, uh, Professor Seralini, who had published a, a study showing carcinogenicity. Again, they went to attacking him. They orchestrated the attack. All the negative things you may have heard about that, that carcinogenicity study were manufactured and generated and orchestrated by Monsanto. They created the letters to the editor. They had uh, the editor who was on their payroll, and they pressured him to retract that study. The study did what Monsanto had refused to do. They had done uh, a diet study for 13 weeks on, uh, on rats, which makes, basically gets them through being teenagers. And not through their lifetime. What Seralini did was did the entire lifetime. And when you do the entire lifetime of exposure to uh, Roundup in their diet, it showed uh, a high level of carcinogenicity. So um, I, I, I have a whole bunch more to talk to you about, and there's a bunch of documents, and I'm happy to meet with you afterwards. You can get access to all these documents uh, and... Um, uh, the trial testimony and all the exhibits that we use in the trial to get the $289 million verdict, uh, dollar verdict, they're on my website and they're in these uh, thumb drives if you'd like. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Um, in, in the meantime, I invite Martin Dermine to come to, uh, and maybe also Professors uh, Lies and uh, Zalek to go already come to. And in the meantime, we can take one or two questions. Il y a des questions? Un ou deux? Yes. You say who you are, who you... Yeah. Euh, oui, euh, Guillaume Ballas, euh, de, je suis député, eurodéputé français. Euh, J'avais une question juridique. Wait, we have to... Uh, okay, uh, just... Uh, so it's, uh, English, uh, uh, one juridical question. Est-ce que... 
um, the fusion uh, between Monsanto and Bayer uh, could be a problem for you, uh, for your work uh, in the United States uh, for uh, the next dossier? I don't think it has any effect. I don't think it will have any effect on what we do in the U.S. We have uh, the documents and the clients ready to go to trial, uh, and we're um, – only expecting that they will be funded by Bayer uh, as opposed to Monsanto when they have their trial team. They may switch teams. They may change their approach or their or style, may change their experts. I don't know what they're going to do because um, they committed themselves to uh, a story that um, we essentially decimated. They took their experts apart. And by using... Uh, peer-reviewed actual science using the uh, uh, International Association Agency for Research on Cancer's um, analyses and the studies that they relied upon and these internal documents, uh, they show that uh, they knew for a long time they had a problem with uh, Roundup's carcinogenicity and they covered it up.